he sits on the window, points the gun right at my face and starts shooting. Thank God I ducked under a mailbox. There was a mailbox on the corner. And I even took my two boys up to the north side to show them the mailbox and save my life. It's still there? Still there. You're, you're I took them sons, to the mailbox. Huh? They were just like kind of shocked, you know. And I took them to the mailbox. That mailbox saved my life. Bing, 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 bing. All the bullets hit that. I would be dead if it wasn't for that mailbox. Hey, guys. Welcome to another episode of Chicago Real. Today we have a pretty cool guest. Uh, Joseph Castillo. Joseph Castillo has a very interesting story, a story of redemption and how he came up on the ranks. And Joey, welcome to the podcast, my brother. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Appreciate yeah, man. It. So um, Joey and I go way back. You know, he's, he's a friend and, uh, and he just happens to be in town. I, I know you're you're busy. You're here for uh, some personal uh, matters, but uh, thank you for taking the time, man, and being on the podcast, brother. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, so, man, I know you've been involved with a lot of things. You're a world traveler. You've seen a lot of things. Most people that the average person th doesn't get to see, you know, and I've also um, tra did some traveling myself, but you've actually lived abroad. You lived in China, yep. and you lived in the Philippines and in other countries, too, but... I just want you to share your story, man, and to our audience. I know that uh, you have a pretty colorful past, like some some of us do, but how you just overcame those things, man. It, it's amazing how your your story, how you grew up, and um, and yeah, man. So share your story. Yeah. Well, speaking of colorful past and traveling, I do have one story about Rick. You know, Rick's uh, he, he's a joker, you know, and sometimes he'd get me. So it was my chance to get him when he came to visit me in China. Well, he actually came with his brother to China. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We connected out there, you know. So he comes to China, and this, this, this story will actually tie into uh, later on how I became famous in China, became a celebrity there. And it was through your brother and, and yeah. Kent, yeah. you know. So that's how that all happened, it was through Kent, actually. Sure. So anyways, he, 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 we get together, he comes to my house, and I'm like, hey, listen, uh, man, I got this, this, this massages. These Chinese girls come to your house and they do massages for like $8 for a full hour. And he's like, oh, hook me up, bro, hook me up. I, I'm going to call him in right now. So I called up the massage lady, and she's a Christian girl, So, and I knew her from church. I said, yeah, she's a Christian girl from church. It's totally legit, you know. So I called up the massage lady. I book her to come over. So Rick's like, all right, well, you know, we're, so we're hanging out. I do remember that. Yeah. And then, the, you know, tuk, 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 someone knocks on the door. And it's my nanny, the lady who cleans my house. But Rick thought it was the massage lady. And, and Rick kept saying, like, oh, Joey, what did she say? What did she say? So I thought, now's my time to really get him. So she, so she comes in, and she goes in my bedroom and starts mopping the floor. And, uh, and Rick's like, what is she saying? I said, oh, she wants you to go lay down on the bed. So Rick's like, okay. So he goes and sleeps down on the bed. And then she's like, oh, you know, she's telling me some Chinese. like, what's your friend doing? And I said, oh, I said, oh, oh he said, um, he, you know, he wants you, whatever. And then he's like, what does she say? I said, she wants you to take off your, take off your shorts, just lay there in your underwear. He's like, huh? Well, I'll put a, a towel around me. So anyways. No, I, I put some shorts on. Oh, he put some shorts on, yeah. And then he's like, now what? And I said, Rick, she says, take it all off. And he's like, no, man, are you serious? And at that point, I couldn't hold it anymore. I just started laughing. Yeah, yeah. And the, and the and my, my nanny, she was getting nervous. She turned all red. And and I finally got Rick back, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I do remember that, man. <laughs> that was just wrong of me. And I think the whole trip, I was like kind of doing those pranks on him, you know. Because he don't know what the heck they're saying. And I spoke Chinese, you know. But. Uh, yeah, man. So share your story, dude. You know, how did you, uh, you know, started, you know, with your, I know you, you. Like I mentioned before, you travel and all well, that. Well, you know, but. so I ended up in China, you know, as we said, and that was, I went to China actually as a missionary. But so it's an interesting arc of character story because uh, I'm, I'm from Chicago and I was at, not raised a missionary or whatever. You know, I ended up uh, growing up, my mother was like the black sheep of the family and my whole family. You grew up with a single mom, right? I grew up with a single mom and, and. That whole family I grew up with is all Italian. But my mother, she was the only one that didn't marry an Italian. She married an immigrant, a Guatemalan guy, 
that she met in a bar on the north side because my mother used to like to sing banda music, like okay. Los Bukis and okay. Bronco. Sure. So she'd hang out in the bars and sing. And so she fell in love with my dad and uh, they got married and, and so on. And they got in a fight because he wanted a, a domestic. He's a Latino guy, so he sure. wants a wife to cook and clean. And, sure. But my mom wants to go to the bar. So they fought about it because she wants to go to bars and clubs all the time. He wants her home cooking and clean, taking care of the kids. So they got a, a split up. He moved to L.A. and he got shot and killed. And at this time, I was about two or three years old. So now I'm raised by a single mom. And she was still bars, partying, smoking weed, drinking, eventually started doing coke. And, and eventually from snorting lines, she got into someone who her to shoot and coke. So she contracted HIV when I was about eight years old from shooting coke. And they were sharing needles in a circle and stuff. Sure. So she contracted HIV when I was about eight or nine. And we lived in the ghetto. We were on Howard and Clark. Okay. You know, and Howard and Clark was like, the whole neighborhood was, was black. And I'm not saying that to be racial, but mm. it was a black neighborhood. So here's a fat white kid, the one fat white kid in an entirely black neighborhood. So I got beat up every day. Okay. Eight, nine, ten years old, going to school. I got beat up every day. And then I took Taekwondo to kind of defend myself. And then when I get out of class, they would surround me. And they say, hey, fat boy, teach what you learn. And they start smacking me around. Yo, you, you, you're tough now. You're tough now. Teach me. You know, and it was, it was terrible. So that's how I grew up on Clark and Clark Howard and yeah, Clark sure, on the north sure. side, you know. So my mother kept on doing drugs and kept on getting high, but she stopped the coke. It was just now weed and, and pretty much drinking every night. She was always out in bars, different guys. So eventually I got tired of getting beat up and uh, we, we moved to another neighborhood. And now I started like kind of fighting, getting the fights, defending myself. And I started hanging out with the gangbangers. Well, actually it started, it really started with um, like hip hop and, and graffiti culture. Mm -hmm. So this is like Chicago, 90, 1990, 1991. Chicago is the home of house music. Sure. You know, so this is the, and I mean, there was no time like this in American history. Yeah. It's not like it now, but 80s and 90s in Chicago, it was all about house parties. Yeah. So I went to my first, and people would like rent these apartments and you'd have like a three or four bedroom apartment. And yeah, they I remember those with their days. techniques, yeah. their turntables. And there was dance crews, like Nike dance crew, Adidas dance crew. You had Fila and all these dance crews. They would like travel around the city and battle. So I'm like 11 or 12 going to these like hip hop, techno, yeah. uh, house, deep house, hip house parties. And people are dancing and beautiful girls. And you're a little kid, you know, and I'm drinking beers. And, and you're watching these older guys like doing all these moves and stuff. And it was just such a cool scene. Turntables and scratching. And, and so that's how I kind of got introduced, you know. That's where I started hanging out doing. You know, and then by like 12, 7th, 8th grade, I met some graffiti writers and it was like hip-hop, Leaders of the New School, Tribe Called Quest, KRS, spray painting, you know, walking to school with cans of, cans of Krylon paint in my jacket, 12, 13 years old, spray painting, tagging, the whole tagging, breakdancing, dance culture. And so that was like fun, and it was pretty innocent, you know, a little smoking reefer, a little, you know, some beers, tagging, breakdancing, it was innocent enough, you sure. know. I'm not advocating for those things, but it was innocent enough, you know. But eventually, a couple of the guys that were graffiti writers in the hip hop culture, they crossed over to the gang culture. And that's where it gets dark. So now some of the guys that I looked up to in my neighborhood that were really like dope graffiti writers and so on, some of them turned out into the gang that I was in. I don't know if I should say it or whatever. You know? Yeah, you can say it. Uh, well, in this uh, Chicago gang, is called the Royals. So this is a gang called the Royals. So some of them, hip hop writers, were, were Royals. And I was in the neighborhood where the Royals were. Now, the interesting thing is I didn't know this. When you were growing up, did you always kind of look at, uh, look, because uh, I've interviewed several people that kind of dabble in gangs. Mm -hmm. And uh, several months ago, uh, I interviewed someone that was like very hardcore, you know, yeah. hardcore gang banger. And so is that something that you look up to? Like you, you wanted to be you know, like them or you kind of looked up to them? Or Yeah, well, I was about to mention that because... 
Growing up in my neighborhood, my neighborhood was the Royals' neighborhood. Mm-hmm. If it was have been the Kings' neighborhood or the Stones' neighborhood, I would have been one of them. Sure, was, sure. So you're, our, you know, just whatever neighborhood you're in, right? right. That was the revelation I had later on, you yeah. know, because I thought like, you know, whatever. My so whatever neighborhood gang. you were born, like how we worked out, that's a gang. You're you gang you'd be in, yeah, yeah all whatever all, you, all yeah. All. Okay. So going to like Blockbuster, my mother would rent the, these VHS movies. I don't know if people in the nineties don't know what these are, but there was a store called Blockbuster. Where you rent the movies. So my mom was sending me to 10, 11, 12 years old to the Blockbuster. And I had to walk right past all the gangbangers. So I was afraid of the Royals. They were my neighborhood gang, but I was afraid of them. I didn't respect them. I didn't like them. They were like dangerous, scary people. Sure. So I would have to go to the Blockbuster with all these gangbangers there. And I would kind of try and avoid them as much as possible. And every once in a while, they would come and smack me around. There was one guy named Tommy Dahl. We became best friends later on, but he was this big dude. And he would just slap me around. Hey, hey, little fat boy, come over and smack me around. And these kids terrorized me. I hated the gangbangers. Right. You know, but eventually, once they, they started kind of like, they started showing you love. So they went from smacking you around, intimidating you, to like, hey, hey little man, you know, and they start kind of protecting you, saying cool things about you, give you, hand you a beer. Hey, little man, want a beer? Oh, and I'm drinking beer now. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. So then they start to show you love. So once they start showing you love, now you start seeing these guys are like tough guys. These guys are like, they're kind of cool, you know. So it trains from fearing these gangsters. To looking up to them? To starting to look up to them. So it, it changed. But growing up, it was like, I'm afraid of these crazy guys, crazy guys. And then they were the defenders of the neighborhood. So that's the mentality you have is, is in that culture is they're defending the neighborhood. They're the police of the neighborhood. They're pro- right. they're, they're protecting the neighborhood. So no longer am I going to get picked on and beat up. Like I had a friend in school, he used to get picked on. And when my gang heard about it, they all surrounded the school and like defended them. And it felt like power. It felt like sure. someone had your back. You know what I mean? So th- that's kind of how you I segued into the gang culture. Interesting. And and so w- when you got involved with them, um, how old were you when when? I think I I turned out I, I turned recall turned out, I think I turned out about twelve years old. Okay. I think it was about twelve years old, twelve or thirteen. Yeah. When so, I turned out. And then became, uh, how, how was that like when when you were like uh, joined the gang and? Uh... Well, it was interesting too. I wanted to mention that I didn't know this, so I think the spiritual world is connected. You know, I didn't know this, but my older cousins who are like I'm I'm forty three now, so my older cousin's like fifty five. Okay. He's a royal. He was a royal. I didn't know that. And then our uncles and aunts were royals at, in the 50s. So, and I found out that my, my, some of my uncles and aunts, they were founding, they were the founders of the Simon City Royals in Simon Park in Chicago. And here, fast forward 40 years later, I'm in a different neighborhood with the same gang. It's like these kind of spirits followed me. You know what I mean? Do you, so, be- you believe that? Let's touch base on that. Like, what do you think it's a spiritual thing or? I think it's a spiritual thing, you know, because okay. how would I end up in the same exact gang that cousins that I didn't really know and deal with were in that my uncles founded? I feel like it was definitely a spiritual thing to kind of, mm. you know, yeah. it was like a generational curse, three generations, wow. um, you know? Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. So, so back to the question about what was your question about? So your, your gang life, uh, what, what, how was that? Like, uh, what was like? That that like joke so yeah dance. so it went from innocent like just break dancing graffiti sure. writing and I was too fat to break dance but I could I could spray paint you know sure. so I was doing spray painting and stuff but then you kind of switch from doing graffiti letters to gang letters right and then you start h- hanging out with the with the with the boys in the hood you start hanging out with your, your you know the guys on the street corner so um and uh, you know my allowance was three dollars a week that's what my mother would give me right. three bucks a week that could give me just a slice of pizza and a pop. So, you know, you start wanting to have some money because you want to buy other things, do it, get some Nikes. At that time, I sure. wanted the Shacks, the Shaquille O'Neal pumps, you know, this is back in 92, whatever. And I'm 12 years old, whatever. So I started selling some of my mother's weed because my mom, she sold weed. I mm-hmm. forgot to mention that. Because when she was a single mom, how does a single mom take care of, you know, sure. three kids? She was a waitress, two jobs, and she got, she had a fake name that she got Social Security under. So she got like benefits, Medicaid, Social Security under a fake wow. name, worked two jobs, and sold weed. So that's how she took care of the, the kids, you know. 
she had to do what she had to do, you know. So I used to pinch some of her weed because she would have bricks of weed mm-hmm. from the Mexican guys that she would date. She she had bricks of weed in her, in her and I would pinch, I pinch it, break it up, and I would sell dime bags and nickel bags in my seventh and eighth grade school. So that was another reason why the game bangers always liked me because I always had weed. So for them, because we're in the same gang, it was free smoke, and then I would sell my other stuff to the school. Mm-hmm. So you started selling weed, then I started selling. Coke, then I started selling crack, then I started selling LSD. So everything just kind of picked up and started, sure. you know. You I got went deeper from, and deeper into that. Yeah, I went from fighting to baseball bats to pistols and shotguns. Wow. By the time I was done, I would walk around with a sawed off shotgun because I wore these baggy hip hop pants back in the day. Sure. And I keep a shotgun, a sawed off shotgun right on, in, my, in my pants. Wow. So it just progressed fast and progressed hard, especially when I started doing Coke. Because I started just, you know, smoking weed, drinking. But when I started doing coke, it's like I lost, like, I don't know. It's like I lost my mind. You know, I was, it was harder gang banging. And, well, I guess when you do coke, you feel fearless, right? Sure. So when you do a couple lines, you feel like you're on top of the world. You feel like Superman. Yeah. So, you know, and if you're a gang banger, you're out there gang banging even harder and fearless. And, and, and how long did I last? Yeah. Well, at this time... Uh, our gang started getting into wars. This was early 90s. And so anyone from, you know, Chicago that was in that you know, teenage years in the 90s, you know, knows there was a lot of gang wars. I'm not sure what's going on now, but so we started fighting with the Maniac Disciples and the Spanish sure. Cobras. And, and they would drive up from Humble Park all the way to my area sure. to do drive-bys on us. And then we'd drive down there. And so we started losing friends. Best friends, kids we went to school, started getting shot in the head and killed. And wow. it be, my neighborhood became a war zone. So it became scary. I used to, just to get from my house to the to our neighborhood where we hung out, I would have to run and hide behind cars and duck behind trees. And, and I'd have to carry a gun with me just to get to my neighborhood. And then we're in the neighborhood. People could drive. I got shot. People would do drive-by shootings on us and stuff you like that. You got shot so at? I got shot at by three car loads of uh, Latin pachucos. And the one guy was sitting, he pulled up to the pulled up to the corner, and I thought I was tough, like 14, you know. So he pulled up to the corner, and I threw down the fire, I threw down the crown, and I'm like, you know, what's up? And they're like, I'll show you what's up. They pull out a gun and point it right at my face. So the driver is there. I'm, I'm where the driver is on the corner. And then the guy in the passenger seat gets out of the car, and he, he, didn't get a, he sits on the window. Points the gun right at my face and starts shooting. Thank God I ducked under a mailbox. There was a mailbox on the corner. And I even took my two boys up to the north side to show them the mailbox and save my life. It's still there? Still there. I took them to the mailbox. They were just like kind of shocked, you know. And I took them to the mailbox. That mailbox saved my life. Bing, 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 bing. All the bullets hit that. I would be dead if it wasn't for that mailbox. So I jumped behind the mailbox. Bing, 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 bing. And I had a bottle, a 40-ounce bottle of beer was on the corner. So when they pulled off, I grabbed the bottle and started chasing them and threw the bottle at their car. But then I looked, there was two more cars. They came three cars deep, with full, with people with guns. So I looked to my right, and they're shooting. And then the car behind us shooting, because we had about 10, 15 guys on the corner that day. Yeah. They were shooting at us all. Man, everyone was jumping on the floor. I jumped back behind the mailbox. It was a miracle that I lived. And so it was quite intense. Thank God I got arrested. And I got arrested because I was too fat to run. Every time the police would come, I'd go to jail. All my friends would take off running, and the cops would just grab me. Eventually, they would just stop. They would say, Joey, get in the car, because I could never run away. Mm -hmm. So I was getting arrested and arrested and arrested, and on probation, then violating probation. But that saved my life. Because being the fat, slow guy in the neighborhood, I would have been killed for sure, like a lot of my friends. Sure. So jail was a blessing for me. And we had a probation officer. She was, I thought she was nasty, B-I-T-C-H, you know. I hated that probation officer because she was like, accept responsibility for your actions. And you have to be a good member of society. I thought that was all nerdy stuff, you know. But actually, she, she really saved my life. She fought with the judge to get me into rehab. She fought with the judge to give me a second chance. Like, I went back after everything, and I became a Christian. I went back to the court to find her, to thank her for saving my life, you know. But she had she didn't work there anymore at that point. But really, going to jail saved my life because it kept me from being shot. Wow. Wow. And so after the gang's uh, life, um, 
What What did you do then? How did you eventually got out? So uh, in and out of jail, in and out of jail to the point where every time I go to jail, eleven hundred South Hamilton, you know the the, mm-hmm. the juvenile detention yep. center. Everyone, all the security guards knew Big Joey. Hey, Joey, you're back again. How you doing, Joey? You know, and so I was really loved in the prison. And people would give me like Snickers bars and peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And I had a lot of favor in the prison because here would come Fat Joey again. You know, here sure. comes Joey again. So it became like everyone knew me. It became like family in the prison. You know, all the all the people that that were in there for longer than me. They hey, Joey's back again. How you doing, Joey? You know, so. The jail time was a just real interesting experience. I had a lot of great times there. I learned to play chess in jail, learned to play spades, learned to cheat good at cards, you know. Yeah. So uh, so that jail time was quite interesting, but I started reading the Bible, too. And then I read the Quran. And we had Muslim a Muslim guy that would kind of teach me about the Bible and God history that was on our deck. And then the my probation officer fought with the judge not to send me to DOC. What is oh, that? Department of Corrections, which is like the, you know, for... Prison. Yeah, prison. She fought and said, put him in rehab. So when they sent me to rehab, there was a Christian counselor there. And he like started talking to us about God and took some of our groups to church. And so I, I was kind of in a spiritual journey because my mother now had died from AIDS. So I, now I have no mother. I have no father. I've been in and out of jail now for four or five years, shot at, friends dying. I, I just was like... I'm, kind of burnt out. Yeah, yeah, I was just burnt out, and I thought that I'm just going to be shot and killed and dead and when I get out and go back to the hood, and, and I'm just going to die maybe hopefully 25 years old, 26, you know. Uh, hopefully I can have a Cadillac, you know, before I get shot, sure. you know. I, that's what I thought my destiny was until I started hearing about God, and that's when I kind of started saying, wait a minute, can I have a different life? Could I, you know, could I have a future? Do I have to end up dead? Do I have to end up in jail the rest of my life? Maybe I don't have to. So that kind of gave me a ray of hope. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, because I, I always hear this and it's very true that um, you you are the byproduct of the five people you hang out with, mm-hmm. you know. And so it, it, it's so true that, you know, you, you got into the hip hop music and the graffiti is because that's what you hung out with. Mm-hmm. And then all it took is some of those guys to hang around with the gang bangers and Sure enough, you know, you, you just became one of those guys, yep. you know, yeah, it's and it's so, it's, it's, it's very true, you know, that statement, and mm-hmm. um, you really are who you, who, who you really hang on. It's so important in life that you hang out with the right people, or at least people, you know, even when I'm mentoring guys, you know, I tell them, you know, you got to be in close proximity, you got to hang out all the people you want to be like, so mm-hmm. you start mimicking them and learning from them, and it's, it's just a natural human thing you know That's so interesting, yeah. yeah so and so you you uh became a christian in mm-hmm. in, in the jail in the system right and how, how was that like to like quit the gangs because i know that they don't take that lightly when you want to quit the gangs and mm-hmm. just quit that lifestyle well there's a couple ways where you could leave the gang life with respect with honor with love mm-hmm. and one of them is you you have a wife and kids People respect, hey, you're on your family, you're on your family thing now, and they respect sure. that. You know, another way is become religious. You know, you become a Muslim, or you become a Christian. Right. They respect that too. If you flip to another gang, you just punk out because you're a sissy. You don't want to get shot. Right. That's not respected. You know, but if you become religious or you have a family, that's understandable. And so my situation, I became a, I became a religious. They call me a religious nut, because the first thing I did when I got out of jail is I went back to preach to them. And I jump out of the car. I'm like, hey, guys, how are you doing the big ride? You're out of jail now? I'm like, yeah, man, but I'm a Christian now. I'm born again. I'm living for Jesus. And they're like, what? And I was like, yeah. They're like, man, the Spanish Cobras are shooting. They just drove past. They just lit us up, man. Come on. Come on the cut over here. And I'm like, uh, and I'm like, uh, well, no, I'm saying you, gotta, you don't got to fight the Cobras because they're God's child, too. You know, you guys are all fighting each other. If you would have grown up in that neighborhood, you'd be a cobra. And they were like, uh, man, Big Ride, you took too much acid. They said, you, you smoked too much weed. You took too much acid. You've lost your mind. And I said, I lost my mind. You're on the That's corner. That's insane, man. You're, yeah, you're, you're like a sitting duck on the corner just waiting to get shot. And I lost my mind. Now, does that make sense at all? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That I'm the crazy one and they're standing in the corner waiting to get shot, you know? And I'm like, you know, I didn't know what to say to him. Yeah. And I said, all right, man, well, all right. 
I said, I got my car, I drove yeah. off, and I disappeared for 10 years. And then no one saw me again for 10 yeah. years. It, it's interesting. You know, tell that story. I know before the show, uh, before the, the program, you were mentioning that you have favor with the main leader, and they're about to, like, beat you up with bats and because and, oh, yeah. you stole That's something, that story. So share yeah. that real quick before we move on to, like, the next. Yeah. Well, you know, I was a shorty, 14, 15 years old. Yeah. Not really and so what that means is, like, you were the, the little guys, right? The little the, guys. Yeah. And I became the leader of the shorties. So okay. I had about 20 kids or 15 kids that were all under me. Because yeah. it's interesting. You're a great leader now that the, your leadership skills, your God-given ability, it was already showing up, you know, and you were like yes. acting. You had no clue, yeah. you know. So. It was, yeah, I had no clue. It was playing itself out, my, you know, how, how God built me, right? So I had all these kids working for me, and I was selling weed and selling coke and selling For the acid. gangs, right? Yeah, it was supposed to be for the gangs, yeah. Sure. And I was supposed to kick the money back up to the top. I make something to kick it back up to the na- to the gang. But I had spent all the money on like pizza and nachos and because and, I would treat everyone. Everyone, come on, nachos with steak on it and pizza yeah. and video games and you know. And I bought my my Reeboks and I bought some jewelries and beepers and I spent all the nation's money. The which, gang money. The, yeah, we call it the gang yeah. the nation. Yeah. So I spent all the gang money. And, uh, you know, when the audit came and you're supposed to kick the money up, I didn't have it. And I had to explain that I spent it all. So I got sentenced to three minutes with the baseball bat by this guy named Fabio. Fabio was like six foot six. And know, he was one of the leaders? Pounds. No, he was not a leader, but he was a big dude. Okay. Big muscles. So our leader, who I'm friends with now, uh, he sentenced me to three minutes with a baseball bat. With this huge dude. Mm-hmm. And I'm like 14, 15 years old. Mm-hmm. So they were they were just about, we were in an alley. And they were just about to start the timer. Three minutes with a baseball bat. A metal bat. And all I could think was, when they click the timer, I'm going to just ball up. And I'm going to protect my skull. And I was trying to think, is there something else I should protect besides my skull? So I thought maybe I put my back against the garage. So my spine don't get broken, protect my skull, let them hit the fat on my arm, the fat on my legs. Hopefully my knees won't get shattered, you know. Yeah. So I'm I'm trying to plan this right before they click the button, the you know, the timer. And right before they 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 they, they start the beating, a car pulls up the alley. And no one knows who it is. We all kind of back up and the car stops because the headlights are on. It's nighttime. The car, the, the car stops, the door opens up, and it's Fats. You guys could Google Fats. Fats was the leader of the Royals at the time. You know, he's on the FBI list right now, whatever. Is Fats, this big-time gang leader for the Simon City Royals. Big-time guy, you know. He g- gets out of the car. Now, I had met Fats at a nationwide gang meeting. Where mm-hmm. All the sets came from all over the country, and we had a barbecue. And... He didn't know me. I didn't know him, but for someone said something about me, I don't know. But he said, hey, big guy, come over here. And I was getting a hot dog. This is how I met Fats. I was getting a hot dog, and I was putting ketchup on it. And I said, I'll be right there. I put the ketchup. I put the relish. I put the mustard. And when I walked over to him, he slapped me. And he slapped me so hard that the hot dog shot out of the bun. And he said, if I tell you to come, you drop everything, and you come immediately. You don't say wait. So I was scared to death because this guy's a killer, you know. So that's how I met him. And I haven't really had much interaction with him. Really? He gets out of the car. He says, I heard the big ride is getting violated tonight. And he said, we've all made mistakes. You know, I tell this story sometimes I cry. He said, every one of us has made mistakes in our lives. He said, big ride made a mistake. You've all made mistakes. He said, Almost like Jesus said about the woman that was yeah. caught in adultery. Yeah. And he said, you that haven't sinned, cast the first stone. That's basically what he said. The guy never read the Bible. Yeah. He said, all of us have made mistakes, especially when we were young. He said, let him go. This is a learning experience for him. He said, if anybody touches Big Ride, I'm going to touch you. And if Fat says he's going to touch you. Yeah, you you that's, don't. Yeah, that's you know nobody yeah. Yeah. wanted to be touched by it. that. Touched me something more than touch yeah. you. You know, so if anybody touches Big Red, I'm going to touch you. Everyone backed off. I got off free and clear. Wow, 
That's yeah. cool, man. What a what a cool story, you know. Yeah. Because that would have been it, man. They would have oh, busted God, you up. Man. You know? Three minutes on a baseball bat. Yeah. Lord have mercy. I think about that often, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, man, it's just part of God's plan, you know. Yes. Yeah, for sure. And so after the uh, – and thanks for sharing that, man, because that's an incredible story, you know. Um, you know, you know, and I know you, you gave your God, your life to God in, in, in prison. Um, and what was after that in your life, you know. Like how, how did yeah. you – how do you how do we get this joy that we have today so so yeah so basically i got out of jail i don't know what to do i decided to to, to live this new life in god and stay clean and sober sure. and uh you know i started watching some church on tv visited that church and, mm-hmm. and the, that church got me to get my gd so they helped me get my gd and after getting my gd i thought you know maybe i should go to sc- continue my education so I went to Columbus, Ohio, went to school, and that's okay. where we met in, yeah. in Ohio. Yeah. I went to Columbus, Ohio, went to school there, yeah. uh, studied there, got my degree there. And uh, from there, I, you, I went You went to, like, ministry school, right? Yeah, Bible yeah, school. Bible school, yeah. Okay. So I, after getting my degree there, I got invited to go to Europe and do some traveling and ministry and stuff. So I went to France, and that was it for the next the next 10 years after that. I went to, I've been to 27 countries. I've... Uh, which eventually landed me in China, where and I became What experience, famous. you know, like, you know, I know you were traveling, you were like, you, you became a preacher, right? You're, yeah. you, you know, you started preaching in all these countries. And so, how was that? How, how was that experience? You know, like, I know, like, you know, it's, you know, you're, you're speaking, you're, you're preaching, right? The word of God. And, but touch base on like the stuff you experienced, because I know you mentioned, a lot of that stuff that, you know, it was like the, the supernatural stuff, the experience you had on there. Share, mm-hmm. share with our audience a little bit on that. Like what, mm-hmm. what are the kind of stuff that you experience out in those countries? Yeah, well, you know, going uh, uh, by myself, you know, to many countries, 26 countries, on the streets with danger, communists could be arrested. Uh, you know, Paris is full of, you know, like all these people refugees there is very dangerous and walk around the streets some of these arab neighborhoods and a lot of danger and stuff i've encountered traveling around the world and stuff you know but uh it fit me like a hand in glove because you know being in chicago and the gangs where i could be shot and killed but i was i had a false sense of security back then i was thought you know i'm protected because i'm so tough but now i'm like hey i'm on god's work i'm doing god's stuff you know, I got God's got my back. So I was had that same kind of gangster mentality when I'm walking the streets of Paris at night, or you know, whatever. You know, or I got robbed in Switzerland and these type of things. You know, I got robbed in Switzerland with a knife. I fought off two guys with a knife, and and I had the same mentality. They said, "Give me your money, your wallet." I said, "I ain't giving you nothing." As a matter of fact, I got two kids and bills to pay. I'm gonna take your wallet. And they, they were, like, shocked, you know, because they're used to, like, robbing soft sure. people. They didn't know they were robbing a guy from the hood, you know what yeah. I mean? So I started kicking at him, swinging at him, and these guys were, like, freaking out. These these were two, two well-known thieves because the police ended up catching these guys. And they said, we've been chasing these guys all over France. They, they've been robbing people day and night. Well, when they met me, it was another story, you know. Right. So that mentality really strengthened me as a missionary, traveling and stuff like that, you know. And also, in growing up in gangs, you have a dominion mentality. You think this is our hood, and we're going to take that neighborhood across the street. We're going to take that neighborhood. You have this kind of mentality of taking land, fighting the enemy. But now I'm a Christian, so I'm like, I have that same mentality. So sure. when I went to China, I was like, I'm not coming to China to be some little missionary and be in a village and learn Chinese. I'm coming to touch the country, to shake the country. I, I've always had this mentality that like, we're going to shake things up. We're going to impact culture. Mm-hmm. And as a result, I, I've, I've been all over Chinese television. I'm known by maybe half the country. I went to Mongolia for some mission trips. Ended up on the news there. Ended up you know, meeting government leaders. Had a meeting range with the president. Philippines, the president, you know, I had a TV show five days a week there. The president came on TV and said, Bishop Joseph Castillo mentioned my name. He wanted to kill me. But, you know, everywhere I went, I have wanted to just make a big splash, a big impact. And all of that really came from that, that kind of that gang mentality, that street sure, mentality. Sure. Like, I'm not here.
here to, to whatever. We're here to take over, you right. know. So if they you, won't start, if they won't be nothing, we'll start something, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Won't be now. Don't start now. Won't be none. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so you know, you, you moved to China, and that's where you met your beautiful bride, mm -hmm. and you have two kids. Um, but what happened there? Because I know that you got famous there. Now mm -hmm. you're in a communist country. They don't allow you. You know, sharing your religion, your your preaching, or anything like that. Yeah. And then you started running some underground churches there, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so and so, but how to, doing that, and then also you became famous, like yeah. national in in Beijing, right? Yeah. And, and, I, and I, I started a company too. Yeah. Yeah. And your uh, company teaching people how to speak English. Teaching right? English, yeah. Yeah. And but how, how did you become famous there? What what was that like? like yeah. Here, here you are, you're an American, you know, and living in a communist country. Yeah. What the heck happened, man? So, uh, so there was this guy named Kent. Okay. The guy he worked for the so this guy named Kent he worked for the the Chinese embassy. Okay. And so he worked for the Chinese embassy in Seattle, helping uh, American businesses enter into China. And do business. Mm -hmm. So your brother worked for a company. Sure. And, and they hired him or something. And they right? hired this guy, Kent, to kind of be his liaison and introduce him to high-level government people and so on to kind of get the contracts and so on in China. So when we connected and, and we just hung out with them, he he met me. A fat guy who's has a loud voice. He's a preacher. He's good. He's and, a pastor. and a lot of people I know that I notice there, like a lot of people are like just skinny. Yeah, Everyone's everyone skinny. in China's thin. So I yeah. stand out like a sore yeah. thumb, you know. So he met me and that was it. Now, about a year later, or a year or two later, he pivots from being a liaison with the embassy to the entertainment industry. He, he becomes like a contractor for the entertainment industry. So he's now hiring models and actors and actresses mm -hmm. to do movies. And so this famous... Chinese movies. Chinese movies. So this big celebrity, he's like the Johnny Carson or the Jimmy Fallon of China. Mm -hmm. he, he, he says to these guys, whether they're hanging out, drinking, having karaoke bar, whatever, he says, I need to find a big fat American for my next show. Does any, could you get me, hire me a big fat American? And Kent's like, you know, I met this fat American. He's living here in Beijing, actually. And he, he's a pastor, so he has a loud voice. He'll be perfect. He said, you know, I'll contract him. Now, he gets a cut. You know, it's, sure. not, it's not for free. Yeah, right, right, you know? right. So he's doing business. So he calls me up and he says, hey, Joey, are you still in Beijing? I said, yeah. He says, I want you to meet me in 20 minutes at this restaurant. He didn't say for what. So I said, okay, well, free meal. Because every time a Chinese invite you, they pay. That's how it is, you know. Mm -hmm. so I'm like, free meal at this nice Japanese place, you know. So I go over to this restaurant and the producers are there. The directors are there. The celebrity is there, and they're all there with their cameras, equipments, and everything like that, so on. And uh, and here's this big celebrity. He wears this cowboy hat, you know. And I walk in the door. He speaks English. And he says, hey, how's China's John Candy doing? And I didn't know what John the... John Candy? <laughs> I didn't know what the meeting was about, so I thought he was insulting me. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what a prick, you know. Yeah. Like He just meets me. He's calling me John Candy, like... But I'm trying to be nice. I'm like, ah, ha, ha, okay, fat jokes. Yeah, I'm used okay. to the fat jokes, whatever. Sure. And then he repeats it again. He says, you're China's John Goodman. I'm like, all right, another fat joke. And, he, and I'm like, good, I'm good, nice to meet you. And he's like, can you speak Chinese? And I said, not, you know, not, no, not really. I've only been here for about two years. I don't really speak Chinese. He said, but it, what if I gave you some lines for a show? Because I'm a, I'm a comedian, and I have a big show with BTS which is a world-famous K-pop group. And he said, we have half a billion views. It's bigger than the Super Bowl. He said, and I want you to come on the show with me. And I said, well, if you give me the lines, I'll memorize it. I'll learn it. And I said, he said, would you, would you be interested in this? And I said, hey, listen, you know, if I could impact people and be on television, reach a lot of people, you know, I'd be interested in doing that. I'm a pastor. I'm not an actor. I said, but I could do it. So he said, come sit down. So we sit down and we begin to have this conversation. He tells me about the show, what I'm going to do. He tells me kind of what he wants me to, he wants me to announce them and sure. so on. And that was my first show. After that, it was movies, commercials, TV shows, talk shows, game shows. Wow. 
We have a uh, celebrity from China here. I didn't even know that. Yeah, well, in China, I'm a celebrity. Like, huh. even if I go to Chinatown here, people recognize me. Really? If I go to a Chinese restaurant, I walk in, like, there'll be some ladies that come up to me, like, are you are you Chowy Soba? You know? What so was your I, I, Chinese name? For, for Mr. 400 is my Chinese name. What, what do they call you? Mr. 400, because it's 400 But in Chinese, uh, Chowy something, you said? Subai. Subai means 400. Oh. Yeah, are you Subai? You know, uh-huh, okay. Mr. 400. Wow. So that was my, I, I had my name that I wanted to use, but the comedian said, no, no one will remember that. He said, your name is Mr. 400. No one will forget it. And I said, Mr. 400? He said, yeah, 400 kilos or 400 pounds, you know. So I I didn't, I felt uncomfortable with that because I don't like fat jokes, but this guy is the big Sure. major comedians so I stuck with it and sure enough everywhere I go people Mr. 400 Mr. 400 people remember 400 sure so you were famous in China huh yeah yeah huh. yeah so after that it was Rolls Royces mansions I mean wow. I was with the owner of uh, of uh, what's that uh, I forgot not Merrimax one of the big you know big movie companies production companies one of the big top 10 movie production companies you know I can't remember the name right now but I was, uh, you know, at their mansion, uh, in their studios. They're riding horses. I mean, just, just a surreal life, unbelievable life. Yeah. Wow. And then, uh, so you did that for a while. Yeah, for ten, for ten years or so, you know. Right. And then and you then, move, then you move back to the well, states. Because the show of COVID, ended. I, yeah. Well, because of COVID, no one was meeting. Nobody was filming. There was no more work, you know. And I had offices, different things there. We couldn't afford to keep them up because I had no work. So we just came back to America. Wow. So what, what is it you doing now? Well, uh, I, w- I took a stab at a restaurant mm-hmm. because I, while I was living in China, I saved up some money and I bought some houses. Some properties here in the uh, Yeah, States, I bought right? properties in the States for investment purposes. But I bought them all in Oklahoma because they're cheap sure. in Oklahoma. So I bought a couple of property. I bought three properties in Oklahoma. So I went to Oklahoma because I had some properties there. And the food was terrible. There was mm-hmm. nothing to eat there. Right. So then I had the idea, well, let me open up a, a pizzeria. You know, so I called up a friend of mine that was a chef in Chicago. I tried a pizzeria. I had no idea that you'd work like a dog day and night. I think sure. you did a pizzeria one time too, yep. right? Yep. I had no idea the work that actually went into a restaurant. So after t- about a year and a half of that, I said, man, I'm getting, I'm renewing my mortgage license. I'm getting back at the mortgages and I'm getting out of the restaurant business yeah. because it was, it was a lot of work. Yeah. yeah, a lot more than I expected. Right. So, you know, just sharing your story it seemed like you know you're you're an entrepreneur at heart from the beginning. You know. Yeah. Well, true. you you true. were you know doing pushing the peddling drugs and weed and all that, and to you know you went to China and it seemed like that always called you the entrepreneurship, the mm-hmm. the going out there and being outspoken and all that, sharing your faith with the world. You know, and so let me ask you this, because, you know, in our show, I always ask people, you know, like what what keeps you going, you know, when the hard times hit and, you know, you ha- I'm sure you had a lot of uh, hard times or setbacks. And so what 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 is that thing that really like keeps you going? You know, some people might say, oh, my kids or, you know, but you're, you're a very passionate person, too. Mm-hmm. So what, what, what was that thing that just kind of made you? Keep going and not quit. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, you know, um, there's these personality tests where they and they have these things called sanguine and cleric and all these kind of personalities. I'm I'm what they would call a classic sanguine. I'm very upbeat, positive. Mm-hmm. Even when I wasn't, I didn't have any religion. I had no faith. I was still always positive. Mm-hmm. That's just the way I'm built. You know. So I'm just built to be a positive person. And I would say that some of the toughest times maybe in my life. You know, I, t- I took everything. Like when I was in jail, I made friends. I became the popular guy in jail. Next mm-hmm. thing you know, I was selling peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. My grandma was snug. She was smuggling me in candy and I was selling M&Ms to the inmates. And like, you know, I've always made, sure. you know, life gave me lemons. I always made lemonade. And I didn't need some inspiration for that. That's just the way I'm wired, you yeah. know. So sometimes I would get on people or lecture people how they need to be positive. But I've come to realize at 43, that's just how I'm wired. Right. I'm wired to be a, a glass is half full, you know. That's just how I'm wired. You yeah, know what I mean? yeah. And um, but when 
when the when the stuff hits the fan, you know, like what what do you draw from? You know, because we all hit that thing where we're doubting ourselves. And mm-hmm. it's like, oh crap, this is not gonna work, you know. Yeah. And so, what what's your go to thing when you're like in those yeah. low lows in life? Well, the toughest time in my life was re- recently, because I went from, you know, hanging out with billionaires, making good in money, mansions, right, yeah. making good money, eating dinners that cost like three thousand dollars. You know, drinking, you know, Baijiu that costs like $300 a, a bottle. I mean, I went from a, such a luxurious life to coming to Oklahoma, trying to scrape, you know, I put everything I had into a restaurant sure. in a building and it didn't work out. Sure. So, it, so at the end, I've spent all my investment, all my money, all my savings, and I'm a nobody in America. So that was a hard swing. It was a hard swing for me, a hard swing for my wife, and then my kids had to go through that. Sure. You know? So that was probably the tough. I would say that was one of the toughest times of my life, because when I was single, I'd make it. I'm a survivor. I'm a fighter. Sure. But now you have a family. Yeah. But kids, now I got to and... answer to a wife. Yeah. Who's like, honey, you know, it was, you know, wives will help remind you of your sure. mistakes. You know. What right. I mean? So I got a mirror reminding me of my mistakes. You know, I got kids that are like, you know have to hear mom stressed out and complain, you know, cause kids will, they, they don't understand what's going on really. Right. But when, when you're, you know, when you're always like, we're struggling because you they're hearing that and they're like, Oh yeah, daddy made some mistakes, you know? So what, what kept so, you going though? Like what, how did you like, yeah. You know? So it was, it was, that was the, probably the toughest time of my life, you know, but, uh, being just being, you know, positive, a lot of prayers, of course, you know, uh, cause I, well, my prayers are like, God, what are you doing? Yeah. How did you leave me abandoned here? I, I wasn't like, oh, God, my hope is in you, and you're my trust, and I'm going to trust you. I wasn't, this was not a time of great faith for me. This was a time of great doubt, actually. Right. So during my toughest time was not a time of great faith. It was actually a time of great doubt, you know. And and it made me actually question God more, like, why would you, you know, take me from China and things don't work out here? Why would you let it fail? But when I really looked at it, it was nothing to do necessarily with God. It was more just like, you know, just, you know, hey, you try to open up a restaurant, you know, I, right, I try to right. do a lot of people do that. Right. You know, not everything works out. You know, how many restaurants don't work out? How many restaurants fail? It's really just living life. Yeah. So really perspective is what helped me the most. I would say Boom, changing man. my and perspective, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah, you, you're, you hit the you hit it right on the head with that. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to change your perspective. You yeah, know, it's how you view things. Yeah, perspective for me, it was everything. And is yeah. everything. Yeah. I I am a believer that your perspective is more powerful than your reality. Mm. And and it, it so is, you know. And, you know, even me as an entrepreneur in rough times, you know, I go to, like, I always go back to the basics and remind myself, you know, my gifts, you know, my, my God-given talent. And I don't I don't mm-hmm. sway from that no more, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I Not that I don't go out, you know, out of my lane a little bit, but I know what my lane is, what I'm good at. Yeah. And I I just go full force with it, you know. And that's why, you know, people have, like, different things, you know. You you might, you know, like you said, your perspective and just, you know, how you're you're viewing things. And you're um, naturally a positive guy. You're just wired that way. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not naturally a positive guy, but I always look the positive things in in situations Mm -hmm. you know and i try not to make excuses for them you Mm -hmm. know like well it didn't work out well you know oh well you know but i always try to like just tweak things and all through your life you've always kind of tweaked things you know like with the gangs and okay this didn't work let me tweak this okay you know um and it's just amazing because it's all the same it's all relative you Mm -hmm. know like we your life it's it's really the same, you know, where you were in the gangs or growing up and even before the gangs, it's really, you were still the same Joey and it's the mm-hmm. same things. You just kept tweaking as you learn things didn't work out, mm-hmm. you know, things that didn't bring value to you, you tweak it to better and better and better and better. And, mm-hmm. and it's really is who we are as a person, you know, and recognizing yeah. who you are as a person. you're just like, Hey, this is my, my, uh, my, my deck of cards in life and I'm going to just make the best of it. You know? Yeah. I'm glad you said that. Cause that, that's an observation that didn't pop in my mind, but it's very true. 
I also came to realization during this time in, in not getting depressed be, or, or getting out of depression because perspective, but then saying, what do I have? What are my gifts? Where do yeah. I thrive? And people will say, well, this person's doing good. This person's doing good. And I would think, you know what? Yeah, but could they move to China and learn Chinese and not know anybody and become a star? They can't do that. I can do that. Right. There's something that I can do that nobody can do. Exactly. You know, and yeah. what are those things and identify them and then and then realize, okay, well, you know, I, I could do, you know, I could thrive in this area. I could thrive in that area. And right now it's mortgages, you know, because as a television personality, before television was preaching, which means I'm good at explaining. I'm good at teaching. I'm good at talking. So if I could translate that into the mortgage industry, I could, you know, somebody needs a loan, they're stressed out, they've been turned Which down. Which you were very successful in the past because you've done mortgages in real estate in the past. Yeah, yeah, and now before you the just, crash. Yeah, yeah. and then yeah. you you're back at doing that, mm -hmm. you know, because you recognize that what you were good at and you were yeah. successful at. And also because I've had a hard life overcoming challenges, when people come to me and say, man, I've been turned down by three banks. I'm like, well, let me see if I could do something for you. Maybe we could do it like this, or submit it like that. Yeah. And we could, you know, I, I have that kind of, you know, Rubik's Cube mentality. How can we overcome? Yeah. So those are, those are personality traits that I've identified, you know, especially in my lowest time. Like, what do I have to work with? What am I good at, you know? Yeah. I'm not good at working a nine to five. No way. No, neither am I'm I. I'm not good at working a nine to five in an office, but I'll work to four in the morning. Yeah. You know, on, on my own business, yeah. you know, so. What are uh, what are some of the books you know? I know you 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 read a lot and um, and you you have like an ex uh, uh, spectrum of different books and uh, but your your hardcore main core belief is Christianity. We share mm -hmm. the same faith, you know. But what are some of the books that you you would say like inspire you or you kind of like go to? Because there are some books that I just kind of go back to. Uh, one of them is the Napoleon. Um, hill book and uh not think and grow rich but there's this one it's like 17 principles of highly effective people you know mm -hmm. that he wrote before uh and i like picking that up once in a while mm -hmm. because it it just it just kind of reminds me right it's like proverbs i, I love the book of proverbs mm -hmm. and i you know for me those are like my go-to some of the rich that poured that books so robert kiyosaki i i go to and uh a dale carnegie book um but what 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 is those books for you like really inspire you and kind of like motivates you? Yeah, well, uh, personally, uh, I read a lot and I've yeah. studied a lot. You right. know, I know all kinds of crazy things. Yeah, know? that's why I you mentioned. Know? I know you read a lot, so. <laughs> but I don't read a lot of inspirational, encouraging business things. I read like theological things, like you know, you know about the you know, aliens and the you know how do the where are the angels and who are demons and what are the supernatural, mm -hmm. how did the the history of religion, the foundings of Islam, you know. So I, I read a lot of like anthropology, anthropology, and I, I dig that stuff too. You know, stuff. I don't read that yeah. stuff, but I watch a lot of that stuff. Yeah, so I so I read and study that stuff, some Greek stories and Hebrews and Jewish, you yeah. know. Uh, you know, writings of Jewish rabbis. So I really like kind of those type of things. Uh, as far as like, like books that deal with daily life stuff, uh, two of my favorite books is one is Economics by Thomas Sowell. And I think anything by Thomas Sowell is fantastic. Mm -hmm. I think will really give you a, a truthful, you know, worldview, a very good, healthy worldview on capitalism and, and so forth. And also, uh, uh, one book that did inspire me a lot, which my wife made me read, was The Richest Man in Babylon. Oh, that's a good one, too. Yeah. I was just going to mention that. Love The Richest Man in yeah. Babylon. And matter of fact, I buy it uh, for a lot of my clients. I've, I've given that book away, too. Yeah. That's a great book. So a lot of times when I do a closing on a house for people that are kind of struggling financially, didn't yeah. have a lot of money, didn't have a lot of savings, I got them a down payment assistance, I'll gift them through Amazon. I'll just mail it to their new address. Yeah. The Richest Man in Babylon. Favorite uh, favorite Bible story? Favorite Bible story. Oh, man, that's a lot because I love the Bible. But yeah. I'd have to say the creation story. Because no matter what I do, I always find myself, when I'm studying the Bible, look at the Bible, I always find myself in Genesis 1 and 2. God gave dominion to man. Right. I, 20 years, whatever, Christian, I don't know, in, in, in religion, philosophy, theology, whatever, beliefs, 
I always go back to Genesis and I'm always going back to God gave man dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, the birds over the land. God given us dominion over creation. And one of the great things that I heard when I was in Israel, that since I was in Jerusalem and I learned this, I've always said it, it was what Ben Gurin said, the founder of the nation of Israel. Ben Gurin said, God gives the wheat, but we have to make the bread. Mm -hmm. And he said, God gives the grapes, but we have to make the wine. And the Jewish people took a desert land and they made a prosperous, flourishing, powerful economy, military, innovation, technology, and they did it with nothing. Mm -hmm. wow. What do you have? Yeah, it's amazing, man. Wow. That kind of made me think, man. Yeah. yeah. Makes you think, you know. And Singapore is another great example. They have no oh natural God, resources. Yeah. Nothing there. And they're one of the most powerful economies in the world. Yeah. yeah. So everybody has something. Like you said, what's the deck of cards you have? Yeah. One more, one more, uh, one more. And I know you're a big Bible. The, your favorite book in the Bible. My favorite book in the Bible would either probably be, uh, uh, you know, probably Genesis or Exodus. Because I also love the Moses story. Really? How, how, how God, you know, the thing... Moses had to be the one to deliver the children of Israel. Sure. Because Moses wasn't raised a slave. Yeah. When it came time for the Jewish people to be delivered, they couldn't use a slave to deliver them. Yeah. Because a slave has a different mentality. Different perspective. We're talking a different about perspective. perspective. Yeah. They had to come someone from the royal court with a royal perspective yeah. that was going to be able to deliver people. You know, I, I you know, and uh, now we're talking Bible real quick. I, I always share this, that of that story, because I like that story. It's not my favorite one, but I, it's one of my favorite ones. You know, my favorite one is uh, in First uh, Samuel chapter 30, you know, mm -hmm. and the story of David when he his he, they got raided by the Amalekites. Mm -hmm. And it's one of like my favorite stories. But talking about and we're we're ending now, but. His perspective is so key because that's what kept you going in life. You know, like if I look at your story, you know, and everyone else is like, uh, it, it's a, it's just amazing how it's just how you look at things. Could you remind me what the what happened with the with David and the Malachi? Well, you know, they in in, in the it's the story I, I believe is First Samuel, the, uh, chapter thirty. Was he king then or no? He they went out and then the Amalekites came and raided and and took pillage. All, and took their women and children away. So they came back. And when they came back, it said that David was distraught. And they all wept till they had no more power to weep. Wow. I mean, they were just crying. Imagine <laughs> crying till you just, like, have no power. Gosh. Like, it just drained out of you. Like, there's nothing. Wow. Your enemies came, and you have nothing. There's no hope. And one of the things that I've read that story so many times that even, you know, like, I... That's one of the go-to things I go in life. I haven't read it in, in years. But it, it, it goes on to say that that he had to first remove himself. And he saw God. You know, he went in and went into prayer, kind of like what you do. You pray. And he requested, he, he, he requested to bring the, his prayer shawl, the ephod. And that's how the, and back then they used to go into prayer and to pray. And, and before he asked God anything, complain, he, he had to remind himself who he was, mm. you know, he encouraged himself in the Lord. Yeah. That's what, like he me encouraged, he first had a rest in the pool, trying to yeah. rest with perspective. Yeah. Right? And so what he went from have, yeah. powerless, you know, cause it said they all wept. They had no more power. He was yeah. powerless. That's how I and then he, the first step is like, he, he, he prayed and he had to remind himself again. He encouraged himself in the Lord. Mm -hmm. Then once he got the perspective where he needed to be, then he inquired and said, God, should I go after these fools and should I pursue them? And, and, and the Lord it says that the Lord answered him, you go pursue them and you shall recover all. Oh, and he okay. went in. That's he went the story. in. Because I heard of the recovery. Yeah, story. and and, the and so came. and he went and kicked ass, dude. And not only did he, so in other words, he grabbed should I lawyer up. <laughs> yeah, should I, you know, should I so and, and whatever it yeah. is, right? <laughs> whatever in life brings yeah. you, you know, like it's all perspective. Yeah, you know, you can't go in there with a half defeated mentality because yeah. that shows. And when I was big in the sales, and I had like sales guys in my commercial roofing company, you know, I you know, and we would like knock on doors and that sort of thing i that that 
I always tell my guys, you know, like, you yeah. got to go in there, man. Like, you're believing it. You're like, your your conviction. Like, you have yeah. to be evangelical about your mission, mm -hmm. about what we're offering. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't go in there stumbling and not, you know, you have to go to the yeah. right perspective in life. Yeah. And that's what everything, right? Like, everything in life. And uh, you just got to get the right perspective. And yeah. don't make a move until you have, you know, your elevate your mindset. Because, you know, the story of Jesus, right? Yeah, he's preaching. People think it's a religion thing. The kingdom of God is not a religion. He, he was talking about perspective, the kingdom of God, dude. It's mindset, you know, like Jesus Christ, you know, he didn't teach, you know, well, he, he is the Christ and, and, the, and the son of God. But the kingdom of God's message is mm -hmm. really, dude, it's your mindset. Looking yeah. at things yeah. different. It's your perspective. Change your perspective. Just yeah. look up. Yeah. Change your perspective. Yeah. Yeah. That's all it is. It's just yeah. mindset. And so, you know, even, you know, with my kids or people that I'm mentoring, I say, dude, you just, you know, it's not a religion thing. They get so stuck in the religion bullshit, you know, mm -hmm. because that's really what it is, you know. Yeah. And it's perspective, man. Mm -hmm. Like kingdom of God is like, you know, it's like he elevate your mind. Yeah, like I was saying, I, I'd like to give a religious answer that was my prayers, but it's actually it was wrestling with my challenges and finding yeah. perspective. Yeah. Know? And and so once you elevate, like you just you yeah. you tweak. Okay, you, you're not that movie star anymore in China. You come back to the states. You dabble in the rest of that didn't work. Okay, what really worked is you know you already know what you're good at, and yeah. you got back into the mortgage business, and you're you know you got the wheels turning. And you're becoming you're successful saying, again, and that so. Um, well, thank you, dude, for being on the appreciate on the podcast, yeah, man. Appreciate, appreciate you taking the time. You know, I know mm -hmm. you 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 have to run, but mm -hmm. um, any last piece of advice, man? Perspective. Take the deck you have. Take the wheat. Take the wine, and make something of it. Everybody has something, and I'll give an example. My wife. My wife's an introvert. She's not a salesperson, but there's other things that she can really really thrive in. Mm -hmm. And so even with her uh, helping her identify what she's good at as a pastor, that's what you do. You, you got these people coming around you, whatever, and you got to kind of identify their gifts, identify the gifts. That was what Genesis, you know, one twenty six, when Jesus, when, when God said, be fruitful and multiply, be fruitful means develop the potential that's around you. Mm. So everybody has potential. What is that potential though? And then find that identify and then develop that. And you can take a desert land and make it flourishing. Yeah. Key words, man. Thank you, bro. People want to follow you, man. Get a hold of you. How, what's your Instagram handle? Well, Instagram, Joey Bagalones. Baga. Just like, you know. Spell it. Joey Baga Donuts. Joey Bagalones. Joey Baga. So Joey's my name. Bag. Uh. So B A G A. Joey mm -hmm. Bagalones. J O E Y B A G A Loans. Okay. And, and we'll put website it on the website. JoeyBagalones.com. Instagram is Joy Bag of Loans. Uh, Facebook, Joy Bag of Loans. Joy Bag of Loans. Okay. Hey, Joey, what's in that bag? Joy Bag of Loans, everyone. <laughs> thank you, Joe. Appreciate it. Guys, thank you for watching. We'll see you on the next one.